the execution a sporting anecdote hunt Mr. Sucka Thumpkin's story Richard Harris bar hum my lord Tom Naughty got up one day, it was half after two, he had nothing to do, so his lordship rang for his cabriolet. Tiger Tim was clean of limb, his boots were polished, his jacket was trim with a very smart tie in his smart cravat, and a smart cockade on the top of his hat. Tallest of boys, or shortest of men, he stood in his stockings just four foot ten and he asked, as he held the door on the swing, Pray, did your lordship please to ring? My lord Tom Noddy he raised his head, and thus to Tiger Tim he said, Malibran's dead, Duvernay's fled, Taglioni has not yet arrived in her stead. Tiger Tim, come tell me true, what may a nobleman find to do? Tim looked up, and Tim looked down, he paused, and he put on a thoughtful frown, and he held up his hat, and he peeped in the crown. He bit his lip, and he scratched his head, he let go the handle, and thus he said, as the door, released, behind him banged, and single quote he please you, my lord, there's a man to be hanged. My lord Tom Naughty jumped up at the news, run to infuse, and Lieutenant Tregus, and run to Sir Carnaby Jinks, of the blues. Rope dancers a score I've seen before, Madame Saki, Antonio, and Master Blackmore. But to see a man swing at the end of a string, with his neck in a noose, will be quite a new thing. My lord Tom Naughty stepped into his cab, dark rifle green, with a lining of drab. Through street and through square, his high-trotting mare, like one of Ducrow's, goes pawing the air. A down Piccadilly and Waterloo place went the high-trotting mare at a very quick pace. She produced some alarm, but did no great harm, save frightening a nurse with a child on her arm, spattering with clay two urchins at play, knocking down, very much to the sweeper's dismay, an old woman who wouldn't get out of the way, and upsetting a stall near Exeter Hall, which made all the pious church mission folks squall. But eastward afar, through Temple Bar, my lord Tom Naughty directs his car. Never heeding their squalls, or their calls, or their balls, he passes by Waithman's Emporium for shawls, and, merely just catching a glimpse of St. Paul's, turns down the old bailey, where in front of the jail, he pulls up at the door of the gin shop, and gaily cries, What must I fork out tonight, my trump, for the whole first floor of the magpie and stump? The clock strikes twelve, it is dark midnight, yet the magpie and stump is one blaze of light. The parties are met. The tables are set. There is punch. Cold without. Hot with. Heavy wet. Ale glasses and jugs, and rummers and mugs, and sand on the floor, without carpets or rugs, cold fowl and cigars, pickled onions and jars, Welsh rabbits and kidneys, rare work for the jaws. And very large lobsters with very large claws. And there is M. Fuse, and Lieutenant Tregus, and there is Sir Carnaby Jinks, of the Blues, all come to see a man dee in his shoes. The clock strikes one supper is done, and Sir Carnaby Jinks is full of his fun, singing jolly companions everyone. My Lord Tom Noddy is drinking gin toddy, and laughing at everything, and everybody. The clock strikes two. And the clock strikes three. Who's so merry? So merry as we? Save Captain M. Fuse, who is taking a snooze, while Sir Carnaby Jenks is busy at work, blacking his nose with a piece of burnt cork. The clock strikes four. Round the debtor's door are gathered a couple of thousand or more, as many await at the press yard gate, till slowly its folding doors open, and straight the mob divides, and between their ranks a wagon comes loaded with posts and with planks. The clock strikes five. The sheriffs arrive, and the crowd is so great that the street seems alive. But Sir Carnaby Jenks blinks, and winks, a candle burns down in the socket, and stinks. Lieutenant Tregus is dreaming of Jews, and acceptance is all the bill brokers refuse. My Lord Tom Naughty has drunk all his toady, and just as the dawn is beginning to peep, the whole of the party are fast asleep. Sweetly, oh! Sweetly, the morning breaks with rosset streaks, like the first faint blush on a maiden's cheeks. Seemed as that mild and clear blue sky smiled upon all things far and nigh, on all, save the wretch condemned to die. Alec! That ever so fair a sun as that which its course has now begun, should rise on such a scene of misery.
should gild with rays so light and free that dismal, dark frowning gallows tree. And hark! A sound comes, big with fate. The clock from St. Sepulchre's tower strikes, eight. List to that low funereal bell, it is tolling, alas! A living man's knell. And see! From forth that opening door they come, he steps that threshold o'er, who never shall tread upon threshold more. God! Tis a fearsome thing to see that pale wan man's mute agony, the glare of that wild, despairing eye, now bent on the crowd, now turned to the sky, as though t'were scanning, in doubt and in fear, the path of the spirit's unknown career. Those pinioned arms, those hands that ne'er shall be lifted again, not even in prayer. That heaving chest. Enough, tis done. The bolt has fallen. The spirit is gone, for weal or for woe is known but to one. Oh! T'was a fearsome sight. Ah me! A deed to shudder at, not to see. Again that clock. Tis time, tis time. The hour is past, with its earliest chime the court is severed, the lifeless clay by dungeon villains is borne away. Nine. T'was the last concluding stroke. And then, my lord Tom Naughty awoke. And Tregus and Sir Carnaby Jenks arose, and Captain M. Fuse, with the black on his nose, and they stared at each other, as much as to say hollow. Hollow. Here's a rum go. Why, Captain. My lord. Here's the devil to pay. The fellow's been cut down and taken away. What's to be done? We've missed all the fun. Why? They laugh at and quiz us all over the town, we are all of us done so uncommonly brown. What was to be done? T'was perfectly plain that they could not well hang the man over again, what was to be done? The man was dead. Not could be done, not could be said. So, my lord Tom Naughty went home to bed.